Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to our second session on the tafsir of Surah Ar-Rum and uh, for those of you who are following along we reached uh, verse number 7 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim ya'lamuna zahiran min al-hayati ad-dunya وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ Allah says, they know some outward aspects of the life of this world, but of the hereafter, they are heedless. Now, who is they? Who is the pronoun they referring to? It seems that it's referring to people in general. In, in the previous verse, we read, about the nature of the promise of God. This is the promise of God, that He gives victory to some over the others. And Allah never reneges on His, His promise. That's how verse number 6 ended. And then, so Allah says, that people don't understand the, the nature of of divine promises. You know, they judge circumstances according to what they see and by, you know, things that happen in the immediate future. So Allah says they don't know. And then Allah in ayah number seven, He He expounds on how limited the knowledge of, of most people is. So when Allah explains how little they know he says they know some outward aspects of the life of this world so allah ends verse number 6 by saying but most people don't know they don't have ilm they don't have knowledge and then Allah explains the extent of what they know. So he, he essentially highlights their ignorance by speaking about how little they know. What do most people have knowledge of? If you meet most people in the world today, their knowledge is, is usually limited to the apparent, the material world. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah doesn't even say that they, they, they fully know the outward aspects of the life of this world. The, the preposition that's used here is يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا So this min is for tab'ir. They only know some aspects of the, the apparent world. They know some outward aspects of the life of this world. So the implication is that they are completely ignorant of the batin. You see, brothers and sisters, when Allah says, when He says, the, the vahir, the apparent nature of the life of this world, it implies that there is what? That there is a hidden reality to the, the life of this world. For every vahir, there is a batin. So you have that which is apparent and that which is hidden. When it comes to that which is vahir, people only know some aspects of the vahir. There's a, a beautiful sermon in, uh, in Nahjul Balagha, Sermon 109, where Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he speaks about really how little we know about Allah's creation. He says, Subhanaka ma a'zama ma nara min khalqik. Glory be to you. How, how great is what we see from your creation. 
كل عظيم كل عظيمة في جنب قدرتك. But how small is all those great things in comparison to your power? وما أهول ما نرى من ملكوتك. Imam Ali عليه السلام he says how awe striking is what we see from your kingdom. وَمَا أَحْقَرَ ذَلِكَ فِي مَا غَابَ عَنَّا مِنْ سُلْطَانِكَ But how small and insignificant is that which we see in comparison to what, it, what is hidden. Meaning that the physical, material world is only the tip of the iceberg. What Allah has created is much more vast. So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they know some outward aspects of the life of this world, He's referring to those who know how to prosper in this world, but who are ignorant of religious and spiritual matters. There are some people who are, you know, by materialistic standards, they're successful. They have good jobs. They have a good financial portfolio. You know, they you know they go on family vacations. They seem to be successful. They know you know about what's happening in the world. They 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 have you know fancy degrees. You know, maybe they've been to an Ivy League school. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying that they may know how to prosper to a certain extent in this world, but they're ignorant of religious and spiritual matters. These are the same people that will end up having a midlife crisis. Right? They can fill their bank accounts, but they can't fill the void that's in their hearts. They know some of the outward vanities of this world, but they're ignorant of the inner realities. You know, they might know what's happening on the other side of the world, but they're ignorant of the nature of their own soul. They're alienated from their own hearts. Now, so this verse is essentially summarizing the, the materialist philosophy. And that is the idea that everything is, is causally dependent on physical processes. That and these physical processes were randomly and and unconsciously generated. So this is a criticism of those who think that all that exists is the material world, that there's nothing beyond that. There are no metaphysical realities. So Allah says these people they only know some aspect of the outer world. Now, I want to share with you a, a quotation from uh, L.S. Lewis. Maybe some of you may be familiar with him. He's a uh, he was a British writer, and he he was actually what you can call a self-taught theologian. And he used to be uh, an atheist. He was an atheist. Uh, probably at the age of 15. His family was very devout. They, they used to take him, they used to attend the, uh, the Church of Ireland. But for whatever reason, he became an atheist. And then he ended up coming back to, to Christianity, to, to monotheism. And there's a beautiful quotation where he, he gives a very sharp criticism of of atheism and those who believe that the only things that exist are, you know, material things and the physical world, and there is there is no metaphysical reality. So he says, supposing there was no intelligence behind the universe, which is the materialist philosophy. Supposing there was no intelligence behind the universe, no creative mind. In that case. Nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking, because it's all random, right? It is merely that when the atoms inside my skull happen, for physical or, or chemical reasons, to arrange themselves 
in a certain way, this gives me a, as a byproduct the sensation I call thought. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? You know, if if there was if it wasn't created for the purpose of thinking, because it's all mindless, it's all it's all random. So he says, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? It's like upsetting a milk jug and hoping that the way it splashes itself will give you a map of London. But if I can't trust my own thinking, and this is really the punchline, but if I can't trust my own thinking, of course, I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism. And therefore have no reason to be anything anything else. Unless I believe in God, I cannot believe in thought. So I cannot, so I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. It's a very powerful statement because if you believe that all that exists is the Vahir, the material world, with these random processes that were not inspired by a creative mind, that are purposeless, you can't even trust your own thinking, your own brain, because your brain wasn't designed for the purpose of thinking. It just randomly, it's a random process. So this is an example of someone who, who understands that there are metaphysical realities. Now, going back to this, this notion of people only knowing the the vahir. they only know what is what is apparent. They're ignorant of uh, of the the batan, the hidden realities. So when we go back to this this idea of of only knowing some aspects of the 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 apparent world. It's it's really interesting that Allah doesn't say يعلمون الظاهر من الحياة الدنيا. Allah doesn't say they know the outer aspects of the life of those worlds. They only know some of the outer aspects. يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا. And this is also reiterated by Imam Al Baqir عليه السلام. He says لعلك ترى أن الله إنما خلق هذا العالم الواحد. Imam Al Baqir عليه السلام he says, perhaps you think that Allah has only created this world, the world that you see. وترى أن الله لم يخلق بشرا غيركم. And perhaps you think that Allah has not created any other human race except for you. بلا والله. The Imam says, "No, by God, لقد خلق الله ألف ألف عالم." I swear by God that Allah has created a million worlds. وألف ألف آدم. And Allah has created one million atoms, one million human-like creatures. وَأَنْتَ فِي آخِرِ تِلْكَ الْعَوَالِمِ And you are in the final of those worlds. And you are وَأُولَٰئِكَ الْآدَمِ you, you are the final atoms. Meaning that you are the final uh, of, the, uh, of the human race. So we are in the last worlds and we are of the last atoms, the last humans. So this shows you what we observe, what is observable to us, is, is very limited. That our, our knowledge of the vahid is limited. You can only imagine how ignorant we are of the batan, the hidden realities of things. Now none of us know the reality of the hereafter. The best that we can gather is what we find in Revelation and what we what we can gather from the words of those who have been divinely appointed as guides. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that 
they know some outward aspects of the life of this world, but of the hereafter, they are heedless. You know, everyone is ignorant to a certain extent about what is to transpire after death. It's something that we have to experience. But at the very least, you should live and conduct yourself in a way where you understand that there is more to this world than what you see. That, that your existence is not terminated with along with the end of this world. So people only know some outer aspects of dunya and they live and they behave in a way with, where they are completely heedless of the hereafter. They don't do anything with the akhirah in mind. Now, how do, you, how do you fix this problem? So this is a spiritual problem that we find in people. That they're very myopic. Their, their vision, their understanding of reality is very limited. They, they're heedless of the, the inner realities of things and they're heedless of the hereafter. How do we remedy this? Allah says in ayah number 8, أَوَلَمْ يَتَفَكَّرُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَأَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى إِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ النَّاسِ بِلِقَاءِ رَبِّهِمْ لَكَافِرُونَ Do they not reflect within themselves? God did not create the heavens and the earth and that which is in between them except in truth and for a term appointed, for an appointed term. Yet truly many among mankind do not believe in the meeting with their Lord. Now this verse is one of the many Quranic verses which invites us to reflect upon the nature of Allah's creation. Why? In order to facilitate that spiritual understanding. So to, to move away and so, you know, so, so we move away from that state where we only know about that which is observable, that here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the solution. That if you don't want to be among the ones who, who only know some aspects, some of the outer aspects of dunya, the solution is what? Tafakkur. That you have to be introspective, that you have to think, you have to ponder, you have to reflect. Reflect on what? You have to reflect on, on creation. You have to reflect on the world, the universe. We live lives where we're so distracted. You know, before, before the Prophet ﷺ began his prophetic mission, he spent, I would say, the majority of his life up until the age of 40 in a state of tafakkur. That tafakkur was really his way of preparing himself for, for the mission that would occupy the, the 23 remaining years of his life. So there are many verses in the Qur'an that invite us to ponder and to reflect. You take, for example, Surah Al-Ra'd. There are many, but I'll just give you a couple of examples. A, a verse from Surah Al-Ra'd and then a verse from Surah Ali Imran. Allah says, "Huwa الَّذِي مَدَّ الْأَرْضِ Allah is the one who has spread out the, the earth. He has made it in, inhabitable for us. وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ وَأَنْهَارَ And He has placed on the earth mountains and rivers. وَمِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ جَعَلَ فِيهَا زَوْجَيْنِ الثين. And from all of the vegetation, the plant life He has made, He has created it in, in pairs. يَغْشَ اللَّيْلَ النَّارِ He covers the day with the night. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ All of this, in all of these things, there are signs. There are signs for those who reflect. What are the signs? What are we supposed to, 
take away from reflecting on the the earth and on the the mountains when we look at the the rivers and the plant life when we when we observe the alternation the alteration of day and night what are we supposed to learn one thing that we learn is that there's order a very simple lesson that we learn is that everything is created with precision with purpose there is there is organization there's organization throughout the universe it's not haphazard there is a system that's number 1 and number 2 is that you know especially when you look at day and night it's a reminder that things have an appointed term that nothing lasts forever So this is this is one verse. In in Surah Ali Imran, Surah three, verse one ninety one. Allah says, "الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار." Describing the believers, they are the ones who remember God. While they're standing, sitting, or lying down. You know, Allah mentions these three positions. Qiyaman, u'udan, wa'ala junubi. Standing, sitting, and lying down. Why? Because at every moment in your life, you're either, you're doing one of those things. If you think about it, you're always in one of these three positions. And therefore, no matter what position you are in, you should always be engaged in remembrance and reflection. Meaning, Allah has mandated that you pray. You know, prayer is has a, a limit. He has set a minimum, five times a day. Fasting one month out of the year. But remembrance of God, but being a contemplative person, is, is something that Allah doesn't want us to limit it to a few times a day. We need to always be looking at the universe with, with deep insight. We should ponder. We should reflect. Now when it comes to reflecting, there are some ahadith that say that we should not think about God's essence. So when we speak about tafakkur, thinking, reflecting, there's one thing that we should not reflect and ponder over. And that is God's essence. You know, there's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he says, تَفَكَّرُوا فِي خَلْقِ اللَّهِ Reflect and think about God's creation. Because that will allow you to appreciate His attributes. You will be acquainted with His knowledge, with His power, with His mercy, with His with his, his handiwork. But do not think about God Himself. Meaning, do not try to comprehend and capture and grasp the essence of God. Why? Because you'll perish. Because you, you are unable. You are, The finite can never comprehend the infinite. The Prophet in another hadith, he says, تَفَكَّرُوا فِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Think about all things. Reflect on everything. وَلَا تُفَكِّرُوا فِي ذَاتِ اللَّهِ You know, think about God's attributes. But don't try to think and understand how God never had a beginning, for example. Or how God can be everywhere but not contained in space. The Prophet says, don't try to understand what that means. Because you'll never understand you as a limited, finite creature, you think in the in the frame of, you think through the paradigm of space and time. So reflect on تَفَكَّرُوا فِي خَلْقِ اللَّهِ And then the ayah ends with, so going back to verse number 8, there's an invitation for us to reflect on Allah's creation. So we can learn that everything 
has purpose. And also everything has an appointed term. Everything ends. وَأَجَلِمْ musamma. Plants die. Animals die. Human beings die. Stars die. The earth will perish. Astrophysicists even tell us that the universe eventually will collapse. You know, materialists, material, material uh, philosophers, especially of the 19th century, they believe that the universe was eternal. It always existed and it will always exist. But we find that that's not true. The Quran explicitly says that things have a beginning and they have an end. And because when you look at creation, everything that you look at has a purpose, you should, you know, if, if day and night has a purpose and the mountains and the rivers, if everything around you has a purpose, you as a human being should ask, what is my purpose? Why did God create me? And because we know that everything ends, it would, contra it would negate God's wisdom if we just perished and that was the end of the story of man. Why create this vast universe and create insan to only live for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, maximum 90, 100 years, and that's it? So this gives us an indication that the story of man does not end with death. But unfortunately, because people don't ponder, the result is what? But many among mankind do not believe in the meeting with their Lord. They don't believe in the day of judgment. They don't believe in the hereafter. Verse number 9. So now there's there's more of a discussion on the mortality, the temporal nature of this life. أَوَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ كَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْهُمْ قُوَّةً وَأَثَارُوا الْأَرْضَ وَعَمَرُوهَا أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا عَمَرُوهَا وَجَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ فَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَظْلِمَهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ Have they not journeyed upon the earth and observed how those before them fared in the end? They were greater than them in strength. They tilled the earth and built upon it more than they had. And their messengers brought them clear proofs, for God would never wrong them, but they wronged themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us not to just observe and reflect on natural phenomena. You know, sometimes Allah tells us, invites us to reflect on the sun and the moon and the stars and the rivers and the mountains. So we can see this profound order that, that exists, that everything has a purpose. But not, we shouldn't stop there. We should also travel and, and look at what happened to those powerful civilizations that existed before us. You know, sometimes countries and civilizations, they think they... they they become so arrogant that they feel that they're invincible. You know, in the same way an individual has an appointed term, the Qur'an also mentions that nations also have an appointed term. There's a, there's a lifespan for the individual, and the Qur'an also speaks about the, a lifespan for a nation. Whether Allah, whether it's Quraysh or with, whether it's the Russians or the U.S., no matter who you are, that we have to reflect on the end of those nations that came before us. Allah is addressing Quraysh, for example, because this is a, a Meccan surah. And they saw themselves as the superpower in the Arabian context. They were invincible. 
They had economic power. They had military power. They had influence. They controlled the media, and the media of the time was poets, right? They controlled the media. You know, that's why they were able to character assassinate the uh, the prophet. You know, when people would come to Mecca to perform the pilgrimage, they would they would send out their poets to make disparaging remarks about the prophet. So they had all this power, but Allah says to them that you need to look and see what happened to those before you who were greater in strength. Look at Ad and Thamud who lived in the lived in the Arabian Peninsula. Look at these superpowers before you. They had more strength than you. الأرض, and they had they had more agricultural capabilities. They had more technology. There are some nations before you, they were so advanced that they were able to carve out homes in mountains. You know, even if you look at the Egyptian civilization, engineers today, they marvel at the ingenuity, at the complexity of the pyramids. Can you imagine, you know, there was no, you know, uh, cranes that existed at the time. That was all manual labor. How did the pharaohs build those, those pyramids? If you look at the military power of these, these civilizations, it was impressive. But what, what, what ended up happening to them? Where are the Romans who once ruled the world? Where are the Greeks? Where are the Ottomans? Where are all of these superpowers? Where are the Umayyads? Where are the Abbasids? Where are those Chinese dynasties? What happened to them? Allah says, they were greater than them in strength. They tilled the earth and built upon it more than they had. They were wiped out. Now, why were they wiped out? Is it because, you know, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just arbitrarily destroy them? Allah says, no. Allah says, no. And their messengers brought them clear proofs. It's not that they were confused. It's not that they just didn't know and they were ignorant. Allah says, I sent them messengers and they delivered clear evidence. Clear proofs can either mean the, the miracles that were performed to substantiate the claim that these are messengers of God, or the intellectual arguments. You know, just like in the case of Ibrahim with this community, that there are clear proofs in the form of miracles and in the form of, of rational arguments. Allah did not wrong these people. He gave them ample time. He gave them opportunities to awaken from their slumber. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so, I mean, look at the power of tafakkur. But it, it's, it's a humbling experience. If you reflect on the universe, if you reflect on the fate of the perished nations, it will humble you. Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salam, he has a beautiful narration, a beautiful hadith where he says, لَيْسَتِ الْعِبَادَ بِكَثْرَةِ الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّوْمِ The Imam says, worship is not abundant prayer or fasting. You know, sometimes if we see someone who, who performs the daily prayers and they perform extra prayers and they fast outside of the month of Ramadan, we would consider them an abid, that this is a great worshiper. But there may, there may be many people who pray and they're, they're, very, they're very diligent with their prayers, but they're not true worshipers. The Imam says, وَإِنَّمَا الْعِبَادَ التفكر في أمر الله. True ibadah is to reflect on the matters that are related to God. This is, this is true ibadah. 
And this is why we have another narration from Imam al-Sadiq where he praises Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Abu Dhar, you know, one of the elite companions of the Prophet. He says about Abu Dhar, كَانَ أَكْثَرُ عِبَادَةِ أَبِي ذَرْ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ التَّفَكُّرْ وَالْإِعْتِبَارِ Imam al-Sadiq, he says the he says most of Abu Dhar's worship was reflection and observation. He did his wajibat, he did some of the mustahabbat, but he was known to be a very reflective person. He was he was observant. And that's that's what we lack, my dear brothers and sisters. We're very distracted. You know, we, we need to become more like Abu Dhar. You know, what makes Abu Dhar Abu Dhar is that he was he was a deep thinker. He used to think, he used to ponder. كَانَ أَكْثَرُ عِبَادَةِ أَبِي ذَرْ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ التَّفَكُّرْ وَالْإِعْتِبَارِ Now, what, what does it mean? Now, practically, what does it mean to, to engage in tafakkur? There was a man who asks... Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam he asked him this question he says to the Imam Sa'altu Aba Abdullah I asked Abu Abdullah which is the kunya of our sixth Imam Amma yarwin nas this man says to Imam al-Sadiq that people report a tradition from your grandfather the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi where they say that the Prophet says tafakkuru sa'atim khayrun min qiyami layla that to think and to reflect for one hour is better than standing the entire night in worship. So he asked Imam Sadiq, is this true? The Imam says, yes. The Prophet did say, tafakkuru sa'a khayrun min qiyami layl. That thinking and pondering for one hour is better than an entire night of worship. And there are other traditions that say it's better than an entire year. It depends on the, the level of thinking. But the Imam affirms that this is true. Then the man, he asks Imam al-Sadr, كَيْفَ يَتَفَكَّرْ You know, what does it mean to reflect in a way that, it, that warrants this type of reward? The Imam alayhi salam, he says, قَالَ يَمُرُّ بِالْخَرِبَةِ the Imam says that he gives an example. He says it means, for example, when you when you travel or when you pass by some ruins. You know, sometimes we pass by an abandoned house or some ancient ruins. We're on vacation, and you know, the tour guide is taking us to where where this person used to live or where that person used to live. It means that when you pass by these these remnants these ruins, you think to yourself, you think to yourself and you say, that where are the people that used to inhabit these homes? Where are the people that used to inhabit these palaces? You know, when I, when I was in, in Zanzibar in Africa this uh, a couple of months ago, I was taken to some area and it used to be one of the palaces for the uh, the Romani kings who used to come in vacation there, and it's still there. And they used, to, and he had these massive pools that he built, and he would he would swim with his concubines, and he would drink and he would feast, and we were standing on that same land where he would enjoy and indulge in the the physical pleasures. Imam al-Sadiq says, Tafakkur is to look at that and ask, where are the people who used to live? They used to inhabit these spaces. Aina banuki, where are those who built these homes and these structures? Ma lakum la tatakallamun. Where are you? Why don't you speak? This is, this is what Imam al-Sadiq is teaching us. You know, when we, when we think about what's happening now with the the coronavirus. This is this is a time where we should be thinking and reflecting, reflecting on how weak the human being is. 
we're, we're always, even, even before the coronavirus, we were fuqara before Allah. You know, it reminds me of that incident where there was a companion of Imam al-Sadiq sitting with the Imam. And there was a mosquito that was, you know, a, you know, a pesky mosquito that was irritating this person, this man. So he asks Imam al-Sadiq, Ya ibn Rasulullah, why did Allah create these, these annoying mosquitoes, these flies? The Imam alayhi salam, he said... To make, of course, one of the reasons is to make the proud and the mighty feel weak. And what we see today is that all of these countries who boast about how much wealth they have, they boast about their military capabilities, that a virus that is not even perceptible to the human eye has brought the entire world to its knees. This is a moment for us to reflect. To reflect on how, how vulnerable we are. How weak we are. So, so the verse ends with, you know, these, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wrong people. He gives us sufficient guidance. And then it's up to us. No one will have a, an argument before God. On the day of judgment, there's, you know, if you recall in Surah Al An'am, when we were studying it uh, maybe about a year or two ago, in verse number 149 of Surah Al An'am, part of the ayah reads, To Allah belongs the decisive argument. What does this mean? What it means is Imam al Sadiq explains. He says, Allah will say to his sinful servants on the day of judgment, those who have wronged themselves, who were misguided, Abdi, Akunta Aliman, oh my servant, were you knowledgeable? Did you have ilm? If the person says, Yes, I was knowledgeable, Allah will say to them, why didn't you act on your knowledge? You had knowledge. Why didn't you act on your knowledge? Why didn't you practice what you knew? There's no answer. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so, and if that person, if the person, the sinful person says, no, oh Allah, I'm not knowledgeable. I'm not an alim. I'm jahil. I'm ignorant. I'm an ignorant person. وَإِنْ قَالَ كُنْتُ جَاهِلًا If someone says, I'm ignorant, I don't know. Are they off the hook? Are they exonerated on the Day of Judgment? Allah says, no. قَالَ لَهُ أَفَلَا تَعَلَّمْتْ حَتَّى تَعْمَلْ If you were ignorant, why didn't you learn so you can practice, so you can act? And this, this hadith is 13 centuries old. This was before... Laptops, this was before the internet. If people at that time had very little excuse or no excuse for being ignorant, because there were, you know, there were scholars all around the Islamic world. You could go, you could have access to them. Now, you know, if someone dies as someone who is misguided, their their the argument that, oh Allah, I did I just didn't know. Is, is not going to hold because information has become very accessible. But we have literally the world, a wealth of information at our fingertips. So it's not that Allah, Allah doesn't wrong us. We wrong ourselves. And that's why the human being in the Quran, if you look at Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 72, at the end of the ayah, Allah describes the human being as what? إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا You know, there's the word ظالم and there's the word ظلوم. ظالم is the one who oppresses. ظلوم is the one who is excessively oppressive. Meaning the human being oppresses others and he oppresses himself. Have you seen a creature who, who oppresses himself? This is the human being. He's ظلوم. 
He hurts others and he hurts himself. He doesn't do what's in his own interest. Verse number 10, ثُمَّ كَانَ عَاقِبَةَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا السُّوءَ أَنْ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا بِهَا يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ Then the end of those who committed evil deeds was most evil. For they denied God's signs and mocked them. The end. The end of those who, who sin, who commit evil, will be a terrible ending. Why? And they will have the most evil end. Their aqiba, you know, aqiba means, you know, the final, the final destination, the final outcome, the end. You know, when you read a book, you have the, the end, the final chapter. The final chapter for these people will be will be very painful because they will confront the qiyamati form of their deeds what they will experience is nothing but the reality of their own souls because jahannam as we've mentioned time and time again is nothing more than the projection of the human soul every thought every belief every action will have a qiyamati form and those who will receive the most painful punishment are those who rejected God's signs and not only rejected them but they mocked them they mocked God's signs and this ayah you know we're in the days of the the martyrdom of Sayyidah Zainab this verse was one of the verses that Sayyidah Zainab mentioned in her sermon to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Why? Because Yazid didn't only fight the Ahlul Bayt. He didn't only order the massacre of the Ahlul Bayt. He was mocking them. He was playing. He was hitting the face of Imam al Hussein and hitting the lips of Imam al Hussein with his stick, with his staff. When Sayyidah Zainab saw that the defiance of this man, and he has reached a point where he's mocking. Islam, especially when the heads were paraded to Dimashq and when he saw them being ushered into his palace and he was standing on his balcony, he recited those lines. You know, Layta Ashyahi Bibadrin Shahidu. I wish my ancestors in Badr could witness this day. Can you imagine this is the Khalifa of Muslims? Killing Imam al Hussein to avenge Badr. Who was killed in the Battle of Badr? Kuffar. This man is still proud of his Kafir ancestors. Layta Ashyahi bi Badrin Shahidu Jaza al Khazraji min al Asali La'ibad. And this is look at what he says La'ibad Hashimun bil Mulki Fala Khabarun Ja wala Wahyun Nazar. That Bani Hashim tried, they played, they played around with this kingdom. You know, they deceived people and they they rose to power because of this, this you know, this fake religion. And then he says, لَعِبَتْ هَاشِمٌ بِالْمُلْكِ فَلَا خَبَرٌ جَاءْ وَلَا وَحْيٌ نَزَلٌ There was no news and there was no revelation. He rejected and he mocked Islam. And this is why Sayyidah Zainab found it found it suitable to mention this ayah, that for people like him, who, who mock and reject God, they reject the message, for them will be the most evil aqibah, the most evil end. With that, inshallah, we, uh, we conclude, and we'll pick up our discussion uh, with verse number 11 next week. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ali Muhammad So it's interesting that how in uh, verse 8 oh it's uh, we're we're basically being uh, invited to reflect to to um, cure our obsession with dunya 
by spending time reflecting on aspects of the dunya itself. Yeah. So, so I mean, and that's what's meant when when the Quran mentions that the the that the the natural world is a sign. A sign. Essentially, the function of a sign is that it points you to something else. That's what a sign does, right? The sign is not there for itself. It's to draw your attention to something else. The sign is a pointer. And the natural world helps us understand some of the metaphysical realities. Right? Allows us to understand that things have a purpose. They have a beginning. They have an end. They are reflections of a supreme being who created everything in the utmost perfection, who, who designed everything in exquisite beauty and complexity. So it is, it is ironic that to, to gain uh, spiritual insights and understand metaphysical realities, you have to begin by reflecting on the material world. So you have to begin with the with the vahir to arrive and to kind of start to touch the batin. And a question, uh, is there something we need to ponder about regarding the current situation? As I mentioned, you know, one thing that, you know, one takeaway is that that it should be number one, a very humbling experience. The fact that something that is microscopic has the power to completely suspend human activity around the world, at least public activity. Um, it's also it's also a time for us to reflect on our own mortality, right? If it's not the coronavirus that takes us out, eventually we all we are all going to perish, and. Uh, you know, and it, it's you know for me what I found to be to be quite uh, interesting to observe is how much precaution we take to protect ourselves from something that might lead to our death. Might, you know, in m most cases, you know, the coronavirus will not kill you. You might get you know an extreme f version of the flu. But unless you're elderly or you have an underlying condition, you're not going to die. There are many who, who are affected, who are uh, infected by the virus, but they recovered. But look at what lengths we're willing to go to, to protect ourselves from physical viruses. All right? We're willing to, to avoid interacting with people because we're afraid of contracting this, this virus. And it makes you think about spiritual viruses. When Allah decrees that something is haram, something is forbidden, that means that that thing, we should look at it as, we should consider it a harmful, deadly spiritual virus. So I imagine that no one is probably going to go to a wedding these days, right? Because they're afraid of contracting a virus. But a wedding where music is playing and non-mahrams are dancing, that's that's a wedding that you should avoid, just like you avoid the coronavirus. Because in that wedding, that's the, those, there, there are spiritual viruses. So these are you know, some of the things that I think we need to keep in mind. That we, we're very protective. And it's important to protect our, our health. You know, and no one is trying to downplay the, the precautionary measures that are being taken. But in the same way that you protect this finite body, that will eventually perish. Think about how much caution you should observe when it comes to protecting something that is eternal, like your own soul. Your body, you know, you you wash it, you bathe it, you look after your body every day. You make sure that you smell good, you look good, you go to the dentist, you get a checkup, you brush your teeth, you shampoo your hair. You do all of these all of these things regularly because you want your body to be pleasant, to be clean. And then the body is something that is that is just, we only have it for a few decades and then it's gone. It's just a vehicle. And it's a rental. 
Our bodies are essentially rentals. We are, we're not, we're not, one thing that we have to understand, and this is something I think that even uh, L.S. Lewis mentions, that we, we, are, we don't have souls. We don't have souls. We have bodies. We have temporary bodies. We are souls. Our essence is spiritual. Some of us, we have it the other way around. We think that we are physical beings that sometimes have spiritual experiences. In Islam, the reality is what? We are spiritual beings that are having a physical experience, and that is called dunya. And then in Barzakh, we move on to another phase. So it's it's a point of it's a point for us to really think about who we are and and what we need to really protect ourselves from, and that is to engage in behavior or expose ourselves to to spiritual viruses. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, in one of your tafsirs, the upcoming tafsirs, can you please throw some light on Khawsa Nuzul and Khawsa Saud? That'd be really good. Sure, inshallah. I, I think I, I can touch on it, especially uh, when it comes to some of the verses that speak about uh, revelation. I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll shed some light on the, on that, inshallah, without, without getting too philosophical. But I think it's an important term at least to be familiar with yeah. inshallah thank you. thank you so much Jazakallah. Jazakallah. any other and questions or comments uh, in verse 9 uh, when we're talking about Rasuls that were sent to previous nations does Rasul in that context necessarily mean divinely appointed people or in say more modern times could it refer to people who are also just trying to uh, urge their governments or countries towards goodness what we know for certain is that it's definitely talking about, uh, you know, when the Quran uses the the term Rusul, sometimes it depends on the context. So sometimes Rasul can mean an angel, you know, and Allah uses that in the Quran to refer to angels. Um, sometimes it refers to human beings in the form of, uh, of prophets. Because of uh, of the word that follows it, Rasuluhum bil bayinat, you know, bringing them clear uh, proofs. I'm inclined to say that this is referring to divinely appointed uh, individuals, because you know, when arguments are made by by ordinary people, usually there is a way to kind of cast some doubt, or there might be some ambiguity. But it seems that this verse, you know, because it's, especially because it's talking about the past, that those nations uh, in the uh, in the past, وَجَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ Their رُسُلُهُمْ, it, it, it gives the impression that their messengers, meaning that they they were actually sent to them by God. So it's it's difficult to stretch it and, and say that it, it applies to anyone who warns their community. It seems that it's speaking about these uh, these divinely appointed warners, but definitely, I mean, the word hujja is much more general. So, you know, God's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala may may hold us to account because some very learned person brought something to our attention. So sometimes an ordinary person can make a valid argument. A, present a clear, a clear evidence that could be a hujja, but to say that this is a rasul with a rasuluhum bil bayinat seems to be a more restricted, restricted meaning. Uh, thank you. Uh, and in verse seven, you mentioned a hadith where uh, it was emphasized that we are the last of the worlds and the last of the Adams of this world. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about why there's so much emphasis on being the very last? Of all of these potential peoples. Now, when when you look at the hadith, it seems that the Imam is 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 trying to say, you know, if, if you if you read this this narration through the lens of of evolution, right? Because we know 
you know, from modern science and from our own hadith that before uh, Homo sapiens, before Adam, there were human-like creatures that inhabited the earth. I mean, we know that from modern science and our hadith also confirm this. So someone might think to themselves that, okay, maybe in the future, you know, there will be more, there will be uh, human beings who, who will look back at us and say that, oh, look how primitive, you know, our ancestors were, that human beings will continue to, to evolve, you know, over the next hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. It seems that the Imam is trying to suggest that, that, the, that there, will be, there will be no more atoms after this, after this, uh, this human race, meaning that, that after us, you know, there, is no, there is no species that will further evolve, meaning that we are the final human race before the Day of Judgment. And that's why you know, the Prophet is called the messenger of the end of times. So it's it's pointing to this idea that the this evolution of of human beings across across time has has ended, and we are the the final human race, the the children of Adam before the day of judgment. And on the note of Akhras, like the Prophet being the Prophet of Akhras Zaman, I think we talked in the past about Akhras Zaman being kind of estimated from as a time from Prophet Adam to Prophet Muhammad would be at least half the time of Akhra Zaman. But it, 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 it would have to be it would have to be more than half because to you know for for it for it to even make sense for the Prophet to be the prophet of the end of times, it would it would logically demand that the time that has passed, meaning the time between Adam and the Prophet would be greater than the time that remains between the Prophet and the Day of Judgment. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense for him to be called the Prophet of the end of times. Right. Because Adam is the first Prophet and Rasulullah is the final. So if we say that you know, between the Prophet and the Day of Judgment, there's a hundred thousand years. How is that? That wouldn't make sense for it to be Akhir zaman Akhir zaman meaning that the time period between the Prophet and the Day of Judgment must necessarily be less than the time between Adam and Rasulullah. But now if, if you take into consideration the Adams that came before Prophet Adam, yeah. would that potentially increase the amount of time for Akhir zaman So, So... The Adams before, because there, because the Adam that Imam Al Baqir mentioned as the final Adam, so the the Adam who's the prophet is the final Adam with his children. Before Adam, there were millions, and of course, million is not an exact figure. It means that there are many, many human-like creatures before Adam. It could be that they were not mukallaf, that God did not send uh, send them messengers because they were not. Uh, religiously accountable. They weren't mukallaf in the way that Adam was and his children. Because having a mature mind, a sound intellect is one of the conditions of taklif. And it could be that these primitive uh, humanoids, if you want to call them that, uh, lacked uh, a complete and mature intellect. So they, they might have lacked that cognitive ability. Uh, one question which is related to last week's class. Uh, so, uh, what is the exact meaning of Sahleh in Quran, the people who inherit the land, and specifically Sahleh al Mu'minin? Uh, what, is, what is the meaning of what? Uh, the Mu'minin who would inherit the land, Sahleh al Mu'minin. I might be mispronouncing that. In, but in, in the context of uh, the Mu'minin who will inherit the, the earth. What is, what is the meaning of that? Yes, that, that's what the question is. So the the meaning of of inheriting the uh, you know there's a difference of interpretation. Some 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 Sunni scholars have said that you know f for example if we go back to the verse in Surah Al Anbiya, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ Some have said that arv is a general term and it refers to paradise that they shall inherit paradise. 
But the majority of the Shia scholars have said that it means that they, the believers will inherit the political power, meaning that they will exercise political power over, over the people of the world, meaning that they will have uh, uh, dominion over them. They will have uh, political power over them. So it's not that they're, they're going to inherit like real estate. They're going to inherit the power structures that be and they will have that political influence. And there's one final question. I'm, I'm not sure if I have the full context on this, but maybe uh, you can figure it out where it was intended to go. But the question is, uh, is this because they were not guided or there are nafs which did not get enough enlighten enlightenment? And this might be in context of the countries, the nations which uh, refuse guidance, but I'm not certain of that. What we know for sure is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just and he would not punish any person unless that unless they had access to sufficient guidance. Now, we can't we can't deny that there's of course the element of divine mercy if Allah wants to pardon people. But as a general rule of thumb, Allah does not punish until the message has been completely delivered to them and they've had access to the truth. So if they reject after the truth has been made manifest, then they're liable for punishment. Now, whether Allah decides to punish them or not, that's up to Him. But that's the, that's the, uh, the general rule of thumb.